offer the land acknowledgement that William and Mary's president, Catherine Rowe, recently approved. William and Mary acknowledges the indigenous peoples who are the original inhabitants of the lands our campus is on today. The Chiro Hanukkah, not away, Chickahominy, Eastern Chickahominy, Mattaponi, Monacan, Nansimon, Nottaway, Pamunkey, Potawomac, Upper Mattaponi, and Rappahannock tribes, and pay our respect to tribal members past and present. We started the Vast Early America Lecture Series in 2016 to feature scholarship often by an OI author with strong cross-disciplinary appeal to scholars of history, literature, gender and sexuality, race and identity, and cultural studies. The lecture has been regularly co-sponsored by our colleagues at William & Mary, the Departments of History, Anthropology, and English, and the American Studies Program. And we want, our, we want to note our appreciation for that. Although in this pandemic year, since we're all virtual, uh, we still think of this as, in spirit, a really collaborative endeavor. So a few notes before we get started about our virtual etiquette and process. The first of all is that we are recording tonight's um, lecture, tonight's event, including, I suppose, my talking without be with, while being muted. <laughs> How ignominious. Uh, anyway, uh, we are recording. So if you are concerned about being on the recording, you should, of course, um, stop your video and mute yourself. Secondly, uh, Professor DeLucia, whom I'll introduce in just a moment, will be speaking for 40 to 45 minutes, and then we'll have a period of Q&A, about 30 minutes. I want to point out how we're going to handle the Q&A and how we're going to handle uh, the chat function. Uh, first of all, we're going to use chat, uh, not as we often do in these events, to chat back and forth among ourselves. We'd like to keep that chat um, only for keeping the queue for Q&A, and also for anyone who has a link to a specific resource that would be helpful for the group uh, to paste in, if you would. And then lastly, how we'll handle the chat. I would like you to use the raise hand function. If you look, um, if you go to the bottom of your screen and you see the participants list, and then you will see that there is a function, a raise hand function there that you should be able to use. Is everyone okay with that? Can someone wave their hand or type into the chat? Other than the people who are telling me that I was on mute. Um, let me know that you understand how to use the raise hand function. Yes. Okay. Good. Okay. Thank you. All right. So we are going to use the raise hand function and I will keep a queue for the Q&A. I will list that in the chat box and you'll be able to see when you are ready to go. Okay. All right. And then I'll ask you to be prepared to unmute when it is your turn. All right. And now for the main event here. It is such a pleasure to welcome Christine DeLucia um, to our virtual space here. Uh, Christine is on the faculty in history at Williams College. Her work in early American, Native American, and Indigenous studies um, includes her prize-winning book, Memory Lands, King Philip's War, and the Place of Violence in the Northeast, which was published in 2018 by Yale University Press. In 2019, the book received the Berkshire Conference of Women Historians Book Award and the honorable mention from the Na National Council on Public History. She is the author of a number of important essays, including, and of course I always have to mention OI publications here, so you know what I'm going to lead with, but including, very impressive, Fugitive Collections in New England Indian Country, Indigenous Material Culture, and Early American History Making at Ezra Stiles' Yale Museum in the William & Mary Quarterly in 2018. This essay won the Adair Prize for the best article published in the previous six years. I highly recommend it. We, if we don't have it open access already, we will make it so for anyone who can um, follow up after the lecture. I'm going to turn it over to Christine now and mute myself on purpose this time. Thanks so much, Karen. Uh, and what a pleasure to see so many friends and colleagues here um, in one space, albeit virtually. Um, even if I don't cite you by name, I think you know the influence you've had on this work. Um, my thanks to Karen Wolf, Josh Piker, Martha Howard, the Omohundra Institute, and William & Mary for hosting this event. Uh, I am grateful for your having done a land acknowledgement uh, related to where William & Mary is, and I will do the same related to where I'm coming from. Um, so are you able to see PowerPoint now? We're good? Okay. Um, so I am coming to you from Stockbridge, Muncie, Mohican homelands, and I really want to start today by acknowledging the community, 
and their deep abiding connections to their eastern homelands, where they continue to do incredible historic preservation, interpretation, and outreach work. And this is despite a long and difficult history of having been removed um, to the west and relocated, um, something that I will return to a little bit later today. My hope today is to share some work that is from a second project and to bring you into some of the methods, the complications, the difficult spaces of learning uh, that are increasingly of interest to me um, that I'm grappling with on a daily basis. And I wanted to begin with this image, which is of a historic sawmill uh, built, operated by a native man in Narragansett homelands, Southern Rhode Island. And I will return to this image because in some ways it is a structuring metaphor for the talk that I hope to share today. Um, and I'll, I'll clue you into what that means in just a moment. Um, but I will pique your interest by mentioning that this is not just a historic sawmill, but if you look in the background, there is a beaver family that has been very active um, also building in this space. So uh, my hope today is to give a sense of the trajectory that I have been on intellectually, socially, collaboratively in moving beyond a first book, um, my book Memory Lands that Karen mentioned, and to give a sense of some of the underlying methods and issues that are now taking me into some very different places. As I was thinking about how to frame this talk, I was realizing that there are two talks I could be giving tonight. One of them is a very smooth, uh, you might even say seamless narration of the 18th century Northeast and the relationships between native communities and colonial communities. Uh, but that is not the talk I want to give. I instead want to peel back that layer of apparent smoothness and take us into some of the difficulties, some of the uncertainties, and the places of possibility and collaboration. And of course, I'm looking forward to um, some questions at the end of this. To set up a little bit of motivation for this project, in my first book, I was delving into the indigenous resistance movement, sometimes known as King Philip's War, and increasingly was interested and troubled by the way that many histories of the Northeast, many colonial produced histories, tended to lose interest in what came after this war. It became a kind of dividing point. And so much of the language that has been out there about the aftermath has tended to refer to native communities as increasingly marginal, as living in enclaves, as distance from the real action of the 18th century, uh, and as nearly fading into a kind of victimhood. This is not the narrative of every history book that's out there, but it is a narrative that is present. And increasingly, I am drawn to ways of addressing that. And so I'll share just a couple of touchstones for this second project. What does indigenous resilience and adaptation look like in the 18th century? A time of liberty and freedom for some, but increasing repression and dislocation for others. What do entangled lives entail at the most granular or, or ground level? The close relationships among native people, people of African descent and Euro-colonial people. And perhaps most important for tonight's discussion, how do these histories appear differently when approached through decolonizing research and interpretive practices? And it's this latter point that I want to offer us a couple of orientation points before then getting into the main topic for today. Um, those of you who have worked in Native American and Indigenous Studies are probably quite familiar uh, with Linda Tuhiwai Smith and her work. I'm a Maori scholar. For those who may not be, I really want to share this and spotlight the influence this has had on an entire body of scholarship and community-based work. Linda Tehuai Smith has this to say about decolonizing research. When indigenous peoples become the researchers and not merely the researched, the activity of research is transformed. Questions are framed differently. Priorities are ranked differently. Problems are defined differently and people participate on different terms. There is a lot we could unpack in what this transformation entails that she is describing. And I hope today to show in a quite concrete manner what some of those transformations entail, what the difference is when a decolonized research approach is attempted. I will not say achieved, but when the effort is made to really shift uh, the modes through which research interpretation and writing are accomplished. I also want to highlight 
that uh, in the years since Tuhiwai Smith published uh, Decolonizing Methodologies, there has been this flourishing of scholarship, of community-engaged, community-led projects across the Americas. And while I'm not going to go into the nuances of all of that, um, as recently as last week, there was a wonderful virtual symposium titled Relationships, Reciprocity, and Responsibilities, Indigenous Studies in Archives and Beyond at American Philosophical Society. And if you are interested in these conversations, I would uh, certainly encourage you to, to read or listen further there. As promised, uh, here, here comes the Beaver Dam and the Beaver Lodge. So I was thinking today for this audience, which is deeply knowledgeable from so many different vantages, how to bring in a theoretical element that has to do with the very process of doing history. What does it mean to engage with the past from the vantage of the 21st century? And I found myself again and again going back to this image, this real place, as I said, on Narragansett homelands, Southern Rhode Island, and thinking about the Beaver Lodge and the Beaver Dam. There's been a lot of animal construction activity. And part of this has to do with the fact that during COVID times, I've been visiting a local beaver uh, community here in my own area and becoming increasingly thoughtful about the work that these creatures do. So bear with me as I, I offer this as a metaphor and then also return to the physical history of this place later on. Beavers figure really prominently in the native Northeast. And here I'm referencing a wide body of scholarship, creative writing, oral traditions that talk about the power of these animals. They have immense power in the land, right? When they dam up water, they change an entire ecosystem. They transform the hydrology. They create gathering spaces for other animals, for birds and moose and things that browse, right? Um, and so there's a huge creativity that can come with beavers. They know what they're doing. At the same time, uh, as I'm offering in this slide here, there is a additional body of thinking that is cautionary, that uses accounts of beavers from ancient times to offer a critique, an ethic, and I would say a kind of method for thinking about activity on the land. Um, and here I'm citing work by Marge Bruchak and Lisa Brooks, two Abenaki scholars who have deeply uh, followed these trails. The story in short form of Kitsiamisku, the great beaver, uh, says that in the, the oldest times, there was a giant beaver who lived along the Quinetico River Valley. And he did as beavers do and began damming up the waters. And before you knew it, uh, the waters had amassed into a giant pond behind him. And he was very pleased with this, um, but it soon became apparent that he was hoarding this water. He was preventing it from being distributed out among the networks of relations. He was causing suffering or damage among those who did not have the water they needed. And so, as you can see from this image at the top, um, the shape of the great beaver of Kitsiamisku is still visible in the land. Uh, he was uh, killed, um, sort of brought down to size, and the fact that this story has been maintained over many generations offers a land ethic and offers an ethic about responsibility, a critique about hoarding. So what does this have to do with practices of doing history? Uh, here I'm going to generalize for a bit and I hope you will follow me down these two different pathways of thinking. I have been grappling recently with, in my mind, what are uh, rather two distinct modes of approaching history, doing history. And I acknowledge that there's a lot of range within these and crossover, but I think that there are some salient differences. Um, so the first of these, thinking about the beaver and the dam and the holding back the water, right? Um, we might describe as retentive and proprietary. Um, anyone who has gone to graduate school has probably been socialized into various forms of this approach. It can involve the following uh, points as I see them, keeping sources and analyses closely held, even concealed until the point of publication. This often involves assertions of discovery. I am the first. I am expressing to you a kind of scholarly novelty, originality. It can involve proprietary or hierarchical claims to authority and objectivity, the position the historian as the sole or at least the primary knower, the expert. These approaches often accord a kind of primacy to textual, written archives versus other forms of recording, knowing, and expression. 
There is often an emphasis on single authored monographs or books, journal articles, and other published products. They often treat consultation, quote, with communities and multiple stakeholders as something that happens at the end of a research and writing process, if it occurs at all. And if we're thinking about peer review, it is typically something that happens within scholarly, scholarly circles, right? So what I'm describing here is a kind of insular, um, an occasion hermetic approach to doing history. I also hasten to add that many of these features are not strictly negative, right? That there are reasons why these systems have developed. And of course, we can talk about that if people are interested. But I want to juxtapose this with what I see as a different mode of doing history. And here we might think about the origin story of the beaver um, being cut down to size and the water then being allowed to flow back out. We might call this an approach that is distributive and relational. What are some of these tenets? Recognizing and valuing longer genealogies of knowledge transmission. Who has been here before? Who has written things or told things uh, before I have gotten here? It involves speaking frankly about one's positionality. Who am I? In my case, I am a non-Indigenous scholar. What kind of relationships does that set up with this work and with communities? This approach might involve sharing sources across networks, making materials accessible to stakeholder communities for their own uses. It can involve collaboration, consultation, and ongoing conversations, many of which are not easy. It can entail relationship building that arises around key topics, sources, questions, and needs. What does a community want? What do they desire research to bring to them? There is frequently an emphasis on process over product, right? So the verb rather than the noun or the finished product. Uh, and then I would be remiss if I didn't include this final point, that this type of work frequently involves navigating differences, communications or miscommunications, and trying to juggle multiple commitments, often on top of other kinds of uh, workloads. The point that I would also like to offer to us um, at the bottom, what are some of the dynamics and limits of this kind of work for non-Indigenous scholars and allies who are inevitably embedded in structures of ongoing settler colonialism? So with this as a bit of a theoretical provocation, perhaps um, I want to now transition into uh, some specifics. And my hope is to braid together two strands of my current project. Um, I, I am thinking of it very much in terms of a process rather than the second book, although there hopefully will one day be a book, uh, in order to bring us further into these spaces of entanglement in the 18th century Northeast. And I want to uh, begin this section with uh, something I have, I have revived from, sadly, the, uh, the kind of dustbin of history, um, what I think is a really marvelous project um, that originated from the vision of Dr. Alyssa Mount Pleasant, a Haudenosaunee scholar who I came to know back when I was in graduate school at Yale. And I assisted her on developing this digital portal, American Indian Resources at Yale. This project, as Alyssa envisioned it, was really in the distributive and relational spirit. The idea was that this seemingly ultra-colonial institution of Yale University had within it incredibly important documents by indigenous people, about indigenous people, and of significance to contemporary communities. However, uh, as we learned, uh, it was often daunting, if not seemingly impossible, for communities, students, other researchers to know what was there. And so the goal of this digital project was to help surface those materials, to bring them into better visibility, and to literally guide people to how to access these materials to then use them for their own purposes. I think of this project as deeply generous uh, in Alyssa's own thinking about it. And my only regret about it, I hope she will one day write about, is the fact that it has, it has sort of now died in a digital space, but may one day come back. This is a project designed to decolonize, to share, to invite people in. What I want to highlight here are some of the images that you can see in the background. And believe me, we spent a long time thinking about uh, the appropriate iconography to use to invite people into this space. These images have been on my awareness for over a decade and are now one of the focal points of my second project. What they are is a series of sketches and diagrams that will be familiar to many scholars of the Northeast uh, that are showing indigenous homes in the 18th century, 
from communities such as Niantic, uh, Mohegan, and other places in the Native Northeast. These are not sketches drawn by Native people themselves. They were instead created by a colonial man named Ezra Stiles in his itineraries or his travel journals. And I have long been intrigued and often troubled by these images, what they purport to show about the real lives of women, uh, of men, of their families in Native communities in the 18th century, and also what is not here, what is maybe misrepresented, what might be intrusive about Ezra Stiles' seemingly insatiable desire to have access to indigenous spaces, to literally insert himself inside uh, the homes of Native people. And the point that I want to talk us through today has to do with my question on the far right of the screen here. Uh, which indigenous homes and lives are not well re represented in these colonial representations, right? So on one hand, Stiles is giving us this seemingly very detailed account of, quote, traditional style indigenous dwellings or wituash, flexible dwellings that could be relocated with the seasons. But we also need to be asking what he's not depicting and what the consequences of that might be. Uh, and so here's where I offer an extremely concise, I hope, uh, description of Ezra Stiles, where he figures into this project, and acknowledge the fact that while he began fairly centrally in this second book endeavor, he has increasingly moved off stage. He's not totally off stage, but uh, increasingly this project is populated by Native people, Native knowledge keepers, and others in the 18th century with whom he was in complex relationships and often uh, misunderstandings. Uh, Ezra Stiles, uh, shown here in a portrait from his younger days, uh, this currently at the Yale Art Gallery, was a colonizer. I want to use that as the primary descriptor because as much as he at various times can seem to have been unusually uh, sympathetic to or cognizant of indigenous people and communities and issues, he was also ultimately a colonizer and had deep investments in carrying forward settler colonialism in New England. He was a minister in Newport, Rhode Island, on Aquidneck Island, so Narragansett Wampanoag homelands, and he eventually became president of Yale College and served in that role until his death in 1795. I will say not more about Ezra Stiles at the moment, but want to take us into a really specific instance in his records that I then hope to open out and show what is possible when the colonial archive is put into a really robust critical conversation with Native American and indigenous studies. Um, I love maps, Ezra Stiles did too, and he created many of these over the course of his life. The one that I want to walk us through is of the area just west of Narragansett Bay, so Narragansett Bay and Long Island Sound. This is Narragansett homelands in the mid 18th century. And the facet of this map that I am bringing to our attention is the point that he has labeled A, which I've drawn out here. It says Sachem's house where Captain Lewis lived. And I don't know who Captain Lewis is yet, um, but want to focus instead on the Sachem's house component of this. In order to ask, what do colonial maps like this show? There are in fact, extremely important vantages on native life and dwelling in the 18th century that are envisioned here. At the same time, what do they conceal? What do they represent only partially? And where may we need to bring in other methods, other ways of knowing to understand even a bit more fully what is happening? So uh, when I noticed this map um, a couple years ago and began looking into the so-called Sachem's house that was associated with Thomas Ninigret, a tribal leader in the 18th century, I became almost enraptured by this story. And I want to share a little bit of the both the, the narrative and then the mythology that has accrued around this site. Thomas Ninigret, uh, a native leader in the 18th century after King Philip's War, leading his community through really challenging transformations uh, regarding land, sovereignty, relationships with colonial neighbors and more, has this aspect of his biography that is really compelling from an Atlantic world perspective. Uh, he, uh, it is believed, um, was sent to England to study as a young man, and as many stories go, these are stories from, say, antiquarian New England histories, he became interested when he was in England in English architecture, 
And as the most elaborate of these stories says, he brought back with him to Narragansett homelands plans for an English style uh, country or manor house, right? This is one version of the story I hasten to underscore here. And so I began to follow out this line of thinking and rapidly came across this fascinating image, which is a hypothetical drawing of what Thomas Minigret's house may have looked like. Um, this is in a recent study by John Fitzhugh Miller. And in Miller's argument, Thomas Nittigrant did not just have any house. He had a house designed by Peter Harrison, a preeminent architect of the day. And the argument has been made that uh, Peter Harrison helped design a really au courant type of English style house for Thomas Nittigrant. Uh, the components were allegedly shipped from Newport over to Narragansett homelands and then assembled into this palatial dwelling. This story is really compelling on the surface, and why so? It offers a different kind of Atlantic history, I think, uh, an indigenous Atlantic that is not about the enslavement of native people. It is not seemingly about uh, the diaspora, the forced removal, the disempowerment of native communities and individuals. It instead seems to be a story of real indigenous agency and cosmopolitanism seeking out these deep connections with uh, English people and systems. And in this respect, right, I've included a map from my first book of the indigenous Atlantic in the late 17th century, in which I was tracing through many lines of evidence, the sale into slavery um, by English colonists of native survivors of this war. This is a very traumatic geography. If the indigenous Atlantic story of Tanis Ninigrit holds, right, it offers a a more empowering corrective to this. It says the Atlantic could have been otherwise. Um, it may have been otherwise. But the story does not hold up in this way. And here I'm distilling a whole bunch of streams of evidence in order to share with you the fact that it is very unlikely, in my view, that uh, Peter Harrison had anything to do with that house. And in fact, uh, I was really excited in more recent research to find this image uh, from a local history publication down at the Charleston Historical Society of what this house, as it was still extant, um, it has since, it is no longer extant, what it may have looked like, right? This is a very different kind of architecture than what is represented here. It is much more in the style of vernacular New England architecture, a timber-framed uh, multi-story house with an attached lean-to um, component to it. And so this brought me into a different kind of storytelling. I began to realize that the stories here about indigenous homes in the 18th century needed to be told much more locally and with a lot more responsivity to what was happening on the ground in Narragansett and related tribal homelands. Where this took me eventually uh, is to some of what I have mapped out here, um, showing not only Thomas Ninigret's house, which Ezra Stiles was so keen to put on his map, right, the home of an elite native political leader, but also to a place that is not on Ezra Stiles' map. It does not appear there. It does not appear to any, it does not appear to be in any of his other records. And this is the house and also sawmill of a Niantic man named Joseph Jeffrey, who relocates among Narragansett homelands, um, which are all interconnected with, with other tribal communities. He relocates there and establishes his own house and sawmill. So this local context uh, seemed to be making much more sense. Um, and indeed, I was really excited to find out that there are not only extant images of this house that appears to have been built by Joseph Jeffrey in the early 18th century. Um, it has changed in various ways over time. Um, but not only was there this photographic documentation, the house itself is still standing. And more on that in a moment. Um, and so I began thinking about other archives. And I mean that very broadly, other ways of knowing that could move beyond the narrow version of history and place that Ezra Stiles was creating in his map, which in so many ways is about elite native people who were in very direct relationships with colonizers. What happens when we instead shift the vantage to take quite seriously someone like Joseph Jeffrey? And what does it mean to be thinking about a more capacious archive? Um, in this case, I almost am, am embarrassed to share this, um, but the clues were right there. Right, uh, Google Maps here shows Sawmill Pond. This is directly where the house abuts. It is where the sawmill was located. And I had to move past my 
original assumption when I was looking at the toponyms or place names in this area. I will acknowledge that when I first saw Sawmill Pond, I assumed that it was referencing a sawmill created and operated by an English person. And I had to work through those assumptions to get to what I believe is the more accurate understanding that this is an indigenous operated sawmill. To bring us a little closer onto the land, um, I had an occasion to go down to this place in April of 2019, which now seems a lifetime ago, and was really um, almost speechless to see how much of this is still extant on the land. And you can see in these photos various traces um, of the sawmill, of the mill race, and of course of the mill pond. And then, as I mentioned at the outset, build right on top of it um, various forms of beaver construction, which tell us about much longer standing types of ecologies and transformation. The evidence is here though, right? And this is material evidence that complements and takes us beyond what is strictly in a textual record. I promised I would say a little bit about the contemporary nature of this place. Um, so the Joseph Jeffrey House is known in a certain way. Um, I was intrigued to see that it was on the private property market recently and was in fact, as you can see here from this listing from a realtor that then wound up on Pinterest, um, that its indigenous history was in fact used as a selling point, right? This says, own an amazing slice of Rhode Island history. The Joseph Jeffrey House, circa 1710, sits uh, where this Native American operated the original sawmill. And I became both intrigued and disturbed by this, that indigenous heritage in a neighborhood that is outside the contemporary bounds of the Narragansett Reservation, and that being outside the bounds is an artifact of history and colonialism, that this house is being used um, to, to market indigenous heritage while seemingly being taken out of um, the control of the tribal community itself. I also wanted to say just a little bit about archives and what is visible, what is not visible. This is private property today, and I was really interested in whether I would be able to visit this house someday, knowing full well that architecture, material culture is a way of knowing um, that is very different than, than dealing with photos or representations um, of these places. And I wrote a letter to the homeowners. I don't know their names, but I know their address because um, I've stood outside their driveway expressing my interest in learning more. And uh, to date, I have not received a reply. So if any of you know these folks and would like to help me make a connection, please let me know. Um, but I think the story becomes a little bit more contentious if I actually follow out this line of thinking. This house today is in one respect quite private and invisible, but thanks to the real estate market is actually very visible. And here I'm sharing, not zooming in, but sharing the plethora of photos um, that I was able to locate about its interior because this house was on the market, right? And so I'm offering us a way of thinking how privatized property in a settler colonial system that seeks to market houses, right, for private transactions can cause various kinds of visibility um, that under other circumstances would be hard to attain. The last bit that I want to say about architecture before shifting gears to uh, the Bible with Wales has to do with how representative or not something like Thomas Ninigrit's house or Joseph Jeffrey's uh, timber-framed house are. And here I want to point, albeit briefly, to the incredible work under extremely difficult conditions that tribal communities have done over the last number of decades. And the example that I'm sharing here has to do with the Narragansett tribe who time and again has had to confront private development projects, condos, other development initiatives in their own homelands, and is often asked to prove historical sensitivity uh, or significance of different places in the context of these development um, suits, right? These often wind up in court. And I share that because there are uh, some fairly incredible records about archeology span that has been done in Narragansett homelands of everyday native people's home sites from the 18th and 19th century. And I'm showing you just a snippet without any locational information here. It is important for us to know that these kinds of documentation did not emerge in a vacuum, but instead emerged uh, out of these much longer collisions between tribal sovereignty and efforts to caretake for homelands and development 
and often state processes that have forced a kind of visibility. And I would be happy to talk more about that if people are interested. Um, this is a quite different circumstance of archaeology, right, about everyday indigenous homes than what you might see in, say, Eastern Pequot homelands, where the Eastern Pequot community has been collaborating with UMass Boston, particularly Steve Silliman, um, to do community focused and community led excavation of everyday home spaces from the 18th and 19th century. And the archaeology here is coming from a very different place and having very different social impacts. So uh, the last, uh, the second part, and then the, the last part of what I want to share today has to do with another set of bringing together voices, moving into a decolonizing space, and some of the challenges entailed in that. And my bridge for this um, is a piece of architecture. Uh, this is Samson Occam's house, a drawing of Samson Occam's house um, in Mohegan homelands. Uh, showing the dwelling of one of the leading Mohegan ministers and teachers from the 18th century. I have squeezed into the corner here the old photograph of Thomas Ninigret's house. And I think that these make a powerful juxtaposition when we put them right next to each other and realize that there's this whole phenomenon of indigenous architecture that on the surface of it might appear very English or colonial, but in fact is deeply indigenous, has been indigenized. There were many native timber framed houses in the mid 18th century is one of my conclusions here, um, which, which may seem basic, but is not, right? Um, to be thinking about indigenous adaptation and technological change. Also, if you were looking only at Ezra Stiles records, you would have a disproportionate sense that we too wash were still by far the pervasive dwellings in this time and place. He was not showing homes that had a more colonial type of inflection to them. Where I want to take us with this is into a couple of stories about Samson Occam, the Mohegan minister, um, who in this portrait is shown with some of the, uh, the tools of his trade, literacy, pointing at a book and demonstrating his own learnedness. Something that I will stress before I say anything more about Occam is that his own stories, his family histories are profoundly known and talked about often quite publicly in Mohegan contexts. And just two examples of this. Uh, this is a map uh, that you can access today in Melissa uh, Tanaquidgen Zobel's marvelous book, Medicine Trail, about Gladys Tanaquidgen, in which she's showing various features of Mohegan homeland. And you can see right in the center of this, the Occam homestead, right? So Mohegans have long known about his house and, and where it was. I also want to uh, stress here that the Mohegan tribe today is very actively involved in public facing historical interpretation about its own homelands. And I was involved in a quite modest way uh, in this digital humanities project called the Uncas Leap Trail, um, which includes both a digital and in-person set of signage talking about the significance of Mohegan places, right? And I mentioned this to say that uh, the process of revisiting Samson Occam comes into a much bigger and much longer stream of Mohegan tribal preservation, tribal historic preservation and caretaking. The question that was animating me about Ezra, uh, not Ezra style, sorry, um, Samson Occam has to do with his books, his meaningful objects, his material culture. I had begun to notice in some of the marvelous scholarship about Occam, um, including from native scholars, that there was a lot of focus on the texts that he wrote, so that he often published or um, sort of the content of his texts, but much less attention to what happened to the enormous library of books that he evidently had and that he most likely stored in the study that was appended to his home at Mohegan. Um, he was very proud of these books and he understood them as integral to his own identity as a teacher um, and a minister. Where did these books go? Why is there not today an extant cohesive Occam library? Where have these items been dispersed to and what has caused that? Uh, and so I began following several rabbit trails and I want to share some of them with you today and then bring them together into this larger discussion about methods and ethics. I had noticed while uh, using Google Books and searching for Samson Occam through, through some maybe unconventional channels, um, this account from the mid 19th century in a student description of the Yale College Library. And what I want to, um, I'll gloss over the first part, but it's referencing the Wampanoag Bible, Wampanoag Nipmuc Bible, and saying this about it. 
this incredibly rare, valuable book. This copy, meaning the copy at Yale, has the autograph of the Indian preacher, the Reverend Samson Occam, dated in September of 1748, of whom it was purchased by Thomas Shaw, Esquire of New London, Connecticut, and by him presented to the library at Yale in 1790. This made me speechless, right? Knowing that Samson Occam had once held, owned, taken care of this extraordinary book that had originated from indigenous contexts and that this became eventually transferred to Yale College in the year 1790, which is five years before the passing of Ezra Stiles, meaning that that college president likely brought this into the collections. Um, so just a few words about what this Bible was. Um, and here I really want to spotlight the work that Kim Tony from the Nipmuc Tribal Community, also head of reader services at American Antiquarian Society, has done in a digital humanities project called From English to Algonquian, looking at these translations of Christian scripture um, and English language texts into a range of native languages. And the Bible um, that is referenced here, you can see one version of it here, the 1685 printing of this Wampanoag uh, language text, which was entirely reliant um, to come together in this form on the knowledge, the linguistic skills, the typesetting skills of native people, including James the printer. Um, there's lots more we could say about this Bible, but what I want to stress is that Samson Occam came into possession of one of these through means we do not yet know, and caretaked for it, care took for it um, for a number of years before it then went out of his possession. And so I began to try to solve what seemed like a bit of a mystery to me. Where has this book gone, this incredibly significant piece of indigenous as well as colonial history? And here is the short version of where this has taken me, including some of the missteps and the wrong trails that turned out to be actually the main trail in their own right. I went down to the archives at Yale to go looking for this Bible and got into the accession records created by Ezra Stiles, who was keeping a detailed list of all of the books as well as material items that were being donated to the college in its, um, its first century of being. And I quickly noticed something was going on here. And you can see from um, the excerpt I've drawn out here that the entry in this accession record says November 20th, 1790, Eliot's Indian Bible. And above that, by Mr. Shaw of New London. Already there's a type of erasure happening. Samson Occam has fallen out of the story. Instead, this is becoming a story in the archive about, on one hand, Eliot, that would be the missionary John Eliot, involved in the original production of this Bible, and a second colonial man, Thomas Shaw of New London, who had obtained this from Occam. So where has Occam gone? He's already becoming hard to see. And here I'm thinking, of course, of the uh, the huge impact of Jeannie O'Brien's work uh, about vanishing, the vanishing of New England native peoples and all of the different ways that this seeming erasure has happened. I think this is one example through a colonial archive. Follow this out, right? Here's an early printed library catalog from Yale. And there's been another loss of contextual information. Um, Thomas Shaw is now out of the picture and we're only seeing the reference to Eliot's Indian Bible. And this continues on and on. Um, I still was holding out hope that Samson Occam's copy of this extremely valuable book was at Yale. And so I went over to Beinecke Library, called up a version of this Bible, and it almost immediately became clear that this was not the book. Based on all kinds of records, this was not the book. And I nearly closed the book and, and left um, to move on to other things, but I decided to have a closer look at this version of the Bible from 1685. And it is one of the most astonishing texts I have ever seen um, anywhere. And I'm gonna show just a couple images from it of marginalia or images and writing in its margins, in the margins of this native language book. Um, the most striking images I think are these, showing what in my view are whales as well as um, small boats with oars and people in these boats. This immediately had me thinking about the deep histories of native whaling, Mohegan, Pequot, Wampanoag, others going to sea, often at the same time that they were experiencing land loss at the hands of settler colonialism, um, and going to sea to, to make a living, right? Might these whales be some kind of reference to that? It is a book absolutely full of animals, 
Uh, they're running all over its margins. Some of them I think are horses or foxes. Uh, some of them have riders on their backs. And this continues throughout this book. By a certain measure, this is not the most valuable copy of Up Biblum God, um, uh, the short title for this, because it has been written all over, right? And from a rare books perspective, there might be greater value placed upon a pristine copy of it that had no writing, had no interventions. But from a different point of view, this is far more interesting, far more valuable, because we are getting these really unbelievable images, inscriptions, writing back and drawing back of what I think uh, was a native individual or set of individuals um, based on some of the other markings that are in here. I also want to say just a little bit about my thinking on this and how that has changed. My initial read of this marginalia, and again, this is a tangent, right? This is not Samson Occam's copy. Why am I looking at it? Um, I, couldn't, I couldn't put it down. My initial take on it was that these marginalia must be signs of a more secular relationship with this Christian scripture um, by native communities, right? Drawing in the margins, kind of overwriting, using the book as paper rather than as a sacred text. But then I was recalling a number of conversations and, and this is often the case, right? Things that people have said at various moments over the last 15 years or so and realizing that that might not be the explanation at all. Maybe this was in fact understood as a quite powerful, maybe sacred, but certainly potent book and maybe there are reasons why the individual with their pen and ink was putting these images into it and not into a different kind of paper. I don't know, um, but I offer these as sets of possibilities and think that this is an especially important move in Native American and Indigenous studies to offer possibilities and to think about what may have been, even if the textual record is never going to be conclusive. I want to draw draw these different strands together uh, and then make sure we have some time for questions by telling you a little bit more about where this took me. And, and yes, I will say where the Bible is today in just a moment. Um, but something that is a little bit different in my current research practices, if we think back to the two different modes of history that I share, the retentive or proprietary, the distri distributive or relational, is in past times, I wouldn't have shared these images with anyone or maybe only with very trusted colleagues. And I'm now in a different place about this. Um, I see them as, as sources that can sometimes generate conversation that might be of interest to others for reasons that are well beyond my own set of, of considerations. And so when I was sitting down in Beinecke in the reading room, I began sharing images from this sort of as I went through the book. And as you can see on the right hand side of this, right, there was a range of responses, really exciting um, and the one that I want to, I want to highlight here uh, was from a Native community member who expressed a kind of uh, deep critique of the ways that scholars, including rare book scholars, have tended to fetishize these texts, these translated texts, to, to be sort of overwhelmed and in awe of their beauty, of the creativity of them. Um, how amazing is it that this typesetting was happening? Um, in the 17th and 18th centuries in, in indigenous language. The critique that was being expressed was that that really loses sight of the circumstances of violence, uh, physical violence, spiritual violence, cultural violence that led to the creation of these texts, right? That these were being produced at the behest of missionaries who were quite intent on attempting to eradicate indigenous communities and their own belief systems and sometimes going to war to do that. And this critique is, is, absolutely, is absolutely important. Um, and then took me down some very other routes, thinking about the larger context for these books. Um, and so while I'm not naming the individual right here, I do want to express just how pivotal that, that comment was to my thinking. To take this out a little bit further um, and rather concisely, I began looking into why did so many copies of this Bible eventually transit out of native communities. To put it in the specific case here, how did Samson Occam lose his Bible? Is that even the right word to lose? And I found myself moving between two different frameworks. On one hand, an interpretive approach that really centers the dispossessive effects, violences and appropriations of settler colonialism. Basically, was this book effectively stolen from him? 
or coercively taken from him. But at the same time, grappling with another potential interpretive pathway here, a framework that centers indigenous agency, strategy, and deliberate participation in market economies and other forms of transactions. So what do I mean by this latter point? Um, this has really come to my attention through some work with other books that were once owned and used by Samson Occam. And here I would like to credit the Occam Circle Digital History Project um, that Ivy Schweitzer and colleagues at Dartmouth have been working on for so long. As you can see, uh, written in the top part of this Hebrew grammar book, this belonged to Samson Occam. He has written his name, Samson Occam in Indian, his book. And for our purposes, the next section is really relevant. He writes, bought of Mr. Neeland of Boston, price 30 shillings. This took me, this small inscription took me down a big exploration of native participation in print culture marketplaces. And it became uh, quite obvious that Occam was a really savvy and lifelong consumer and seller of books, right? And so he knows about the value of books. And in a certain respect, that makes it quite possible that he sold his Bible um, very much in this spirit of engaging in a marketplace. Um, but the place where I want to, to wrap all this together has to do with trying to figure out what happened to this book. And here's where I talk about the limits of the archive, but then also the possibilities of other kinds of connections. I tried to figure out what the relationship was between Samson Occam and Thomas Shaw. Why would Thomas Shaw have sought this Bible from Occam? And I got as far as this, which is a finding aid at Yale University Libraries that describes all of the correspondence by sender name um, in the Shaw family papers. And I was really excited to locate Occam's name misspelled here, right? It doesn't come up in a, in a keyword search, but it comes up if you look for it. But then I hit the asterisk and asked the library staff, what does the asterisk mean? And the unfortunate answer was, it means a letter that was known to exist, but never made it to Yale. And I thought, oh, this is the end of the story. This is, this is the end of the road. But then, <laughs> Uh, I think the letter is this. Um, this is a letter uh, currently held at New London County Historical Society from Samson Occam to Thomas Shaw, written at Mohegan in 1788. Occam says this to Shaw, I intended to make some amends to you, but when I got home, I found my family destitute of everything. They had neither meat nor bread. I beg your patience a little longer and I will endeavor to pay you. What this is alerting us to is that Thomas Shaw was a creditor to Samson Occam, who, because of colonialism, increasingly experienced massive indebtedness over the course of his life. And I think that this letter is really crucial to understanding at least one dimension of how he came to lose his Bible. He had debts to pay, and this is one of the most valuable items that he owned. I also want to point out that I didn't find this letter um, in the ether. I found it because someone else, several other people, had already found it. And in this case, that is the Yale Indian Papers Project, a digital um, collaborative endeavor that is strongly community connected and responsive to communities' own interests. Without their labor, this book, or this letter, I'm sorry, um, would not have been visible to me. And I mention this here because I think, I think there can be a tendency among historians to, to kind of go through the motions of acknowledging libraries and archives as crucial to the work we do, but not to do that in the most profound way that is needed and to recognize that the very visibility of some of these materials, in this case, indigenous materials, relies on the careful, and in this case, deliberately decolonizing effort to bring together sources about the native Northeast. So the place where I will stop today um, is telling you just a little bit about where this Bible is today and then where it may go. It is currently in the collections of the Clements Library in Michigan, in Ann Arbor, and I, became aware of this uh, shortly before the COVID shutdowns happened and thought that that was going to be the end of the trail for the foreseeable future because I can't get to Michigan. Um, but I am deeply indebted to uh, Emmy Hastings, a staff member at the Clements Library, who very rapidly and responsibly took a series of digital images here. And this is one of the front pages showing Samson Occam's name, the fact that he had acquired this, and then this history of loss or of sale and its, its sort of afterlives. This again is not a book that I discovered. Um, I was able to find this because the very careful catalogers at the Clements Library had done something really important. They had brought Occam back into visibility. 
if you look here in this note, they include the fact that it has this inscription with the Reverend Samson Occam, and therefore I was able to find this in the catalog. They have also put Occam's name in uh, the association field here, right? And so the visibility here depends partly on my asking the right questions, but also on the labor that has long been done in these collections. Where does this all take us? Um, I am so grateful to Emmy Hastings and Columbus Library staff for making these digital images available and for allowing me to circulate them. Because what I did almost immediately after this was to send them over to the Mohegan tribe. And knowing full well their own deep knowledge, offer these and say, you know, is there, is there anything that I could assist with here that relates to your own cultural um, and historical work? And this then set off a really lively conversation, including what um, this word here, Uskuig, um, a native language word underneath Samson Occam's name, might mean. This would not have been possible without the rapid digitization. Those relationships would not have, have continued in that way at that time. The final sort of twist of this um, has to do with Native communities' own relationships with each other, which are very different than my personal role in this. Um, that Native language word I mentioned, Uskuig. Um, I had a guess about what it meant. I am not a lang native language speaker in any respect. Um, I had been looking at a glossary and thinking it might be X kind of reference, um, but it was really the Mohegans reaching out to the Wampanoags, um, and particularly the Wampanoag Language Reclamation Project, which has been doing this phenomenal work to bring back the Wampanoag language. They reached out, and through that channel, a, an exchange began about the meanings of this word. And I mentioned this because this is also a really important part of the methods that I began talking about today, that there are all manner of intertribal relationships, nation to nation connections between indigenous communities in and beyond the Northeast. And some of those are visible and accessible to outsiders, to scholars, some of them very much are not. And that that is as it ought to be, right? Um, knowing when to step back and, and respect what is happening between communities. Um, the slide that I want to, to end this on here has to do with Samson Occam in the 21st century. And to offer all of us a chance, if we are interested, to know that July 14th has now been recognized as Samson Occam Day. This is a proclamation issued by the Brothertown Indian Nation. Samson Occam helped found this community. He left New England along with many native counterparts as part of a Christian outmigration West, uh, also trying to get away from the intense hostility, violence and dispossession of settler colonialism in New England. They moved West um, as the sign denotes first to upstate New York uh, and eventually over to Wisconsin. And I want to acknowledge that it was quite late in this whole process that it occurred to me to share uh, this book um, and some of its histories with the Brothertown Indian Nation. And those conversations are happening as we speak, and it is really exciting to know how this quite small item is relating to the vast amount of historical work that the tribe has already been doing, and their interest, as in the case of this proclamation, in not just recognizing Samson Occam, but honoring him. And for us to be thinking together about some possibilities for bringing libraries, communities, archives, other kinds of resources into a, a collaborative and respectful type of conversation. So I will stop screen sharing here, um, if I can manage to turn this off, <laughs> there we go, and would be happy to, um, to take some questions or hear responses to this. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, I have no idea. Thank you so much, Christine. Anyone, uh, make sure all that you've got your, that you're on mute um, unless you are ready to ask a question, okay? Mm -hmm. um, if everyone can hit mute here, I can see lots of people are not muted. So, uh, because that is because the, uh, one of my co-hosts, Martha Howard, has just unmuted everyone. Uh, so either mute yourself. Uh, okay. All right. The other uh, two points here. One, we're trying to get the raised hand function there. Um, if you can't see the raised hand function and you want to ask a question, go ahead and just type raise hand, literally, in the, in the chat, okay? And I will keep the cue. Um, one other quick thing. At the end of this uh, event, you will get an email survey from the OI. We've been working very hard 
to be thoughtful about how we structure our virtual events. And that includes things like etiquette and process um, and care and thoughtfulness about our presenters' experience as well as the audience's experience. And this is really an iterative um, sort of thing for us. So we would be very, very grateful if you could respond to that survey. It's, it's quite helpful for us. Okay, I don't see hands raised unless, um, and I don't see anybody having said raise hand in the chat. So I'm gonna go ahead and ask a question, Christine, if you don't mind, I will launch the first, which is um, first to just uh, thank you again for this incredibly thoughtful um, presentation, um, just incredibly rich and um, rewarding. And I wanted to ask you about distributed uh, distributive and relational methodology and ask your thoughts about how digitization and digital work can facilitate. I mean, I think you gave us that example right off the bat with Elizabeth Mount Pleasant's work at Yale that you participated in um, and that she invited you into, but are there other ways you want to talk about or you can give us some thoughts about how uh, the digital world can facilitate this work? Yeah, um, it's, a, it's a great question because there are some tensions that are, are foundational to digitization in relation to indigenous studies. And one of those is, on one hand, a desire and intention to make materials far more accessible to communities who either created them or are um, deeply connected to them today. And at the same time, to realize that there are some necessary cautions, constraints, restrictions on how to make that material available. And the example that of course comes to mind is Mukatu, um, which creates different community protocols that can limit how say a digitized document or, or digital surrogate for an item can be shared. It might only be made available to certain community members uh, at certain times rather than fully put out there on the internet. And so that was something that, that has definitely been present from that AIS resources portal. And then in many of these ensuing conversations, including how to know if material is sensitive, what our relationship ought to be between a repository and a community. Um, often there are not relationships that have been forged. And so that initial conversation can come from a point of real difficulty, right? A library saying, we have this incredibly sensitive material, what should we do with it? And that's a, a tough place to begin a conversation. Um, but something like the Yale Indian Papers Project, which is now known as the Native Northeast Collaborative, has been doing what I think is, is pathbreaking work um, in the Northeast about ethics on this and working really closely with advisors, both within libraries and then in communities, and considering such things as what to do with language that uh, both historically and today is very difficult language, is very um, uh, outright racist language, right? What to do with that when material is digitized or transcribed. And their process on this is really, really thoughtful. Um, I think it's a, little bit, it's a little bit less known how an individual might go about this, right? And this is part of my reason for sharing my own process, which is very, I wouldn't say ad hoc, but it evolves you know, with my own idiosyncrasies. And in one manner, I think individuals have a lot more leeway than institutions who are often going through multiple levels of review on these processes. I, as an individual, can make decisions to share, although in this case, with the Clements Library materials, asked, of course, if that would be all right, um, to share these materials. And uh, I, see, I see Paul Erickson from the Clements Library, who, um, who's been, hi Paul, um, really great about making sure that these materials can move in these ways um, and hopefully lead to some further conversations. Great, thank you. I've got other questions to ask about that, but I'm going to um, go to the queue now. We have, the, we have a queue of one, I suspect it will grow. So let's begin with Marie. Go ahead and unmute. It was absolutely fascinating to hear. Um, and I guess I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about the images in the Bible that you pulled out um, and that you showed us all. Because um, the first thing that, that came to my mind when I saw the whale was the story of Jonah. And so I guess I'm wondering, like, is there, are there connections between, you know, between the page between the text and the images? Um, and a little bit more about those images because I thought they were absolutely fascinating. Yeah, uh, and here again, I'm, I'm seeing on my screen Hilary Wiss, who has done really great work on, on contextualizing these kind of marginalia. Um, that was one of the first questions that came up when I shared this on social media, actually. Does the, do these images accord with the content of scripture, right? Is there a relational quality there? And some of the, the challenge there, right, is I am not a reader of 
Wampanoag Massachusetts language. Having said that, uh, and also recognizing that the community's language revitalization program at the moment is within the community. It is not something that is being taught outside the community, um, and that needs to be respected. There are ways that non-speakers of the language can figure out what part of scripture this is through headings, through certain words that are not translated uh, into the indigenous language. And my preliminary look at this is that there does not seem to be an obvious connection, but I love your point because the, the citing of those images may have other kinds of meaning, including other levels of religious or other significance that are, are not yet on my radar. And so I would, I would be careful at this juncture at saying that there's no relationship between the scripture and between the images. There might be one, and it might be a quite unexpected one. I was not seeing something like the Jonah story, right? Um, that would be, on the face of it, really, really excellent. Um, but as these stories often involve, right, it's, it's usually not something that obvious. It's something um, often quite, quite subtle. Thank you for that. Thank you. Okay, I think the raise hand function is sort of working now. Okay, so we've got uh, E. Bennett Jones here. Uh, hi, thank you so much. That was a great talk. Um, I actually had a very similar question to Marie, which is I was wondering if you had any information on the ownership of that other Bible or how it came to enter into the library collection. Yeah, so thank you so much about that. I believe that that Bible, I wish I had all my bibliographic notes here, was from a totally different collector, a, a European um, Euro colonial collector and uh, Really, it's hard to say what the indigenous um, prior ownership might have been on that. My reason for thinking that is because there are a number of um, textual inscriptions in there um, that seem based on other things people have worked on to be from that kind of context. Um, but if I might also expand a little bit on, on what you're asking about these Bibles, I began looking into how many of these Bibles left indigenous families and the circumstances of that. And one example that I would love to um, talk with Kim Tony about at some point, I believe is the copy at American Antiquarian Society, which has an inscription in it related to what is likely the Spotso family on Nantucket. And I started looking into mid 18th century context on Nantucket. There's a massive devastating epidemic that comes through there and results in, in huge demographic losses for the native community. And there's an archeologist, um, Elizabeth Little, who, um, examined what happened to native people's property in the aftermath of that epidemic. And one of her most extraordinary findings was that the homes that had been inhabited by native people were being appropriated, like literally physically and legally or illegally appropriated by white colonizers. And so we may never conclusively know what happened to that Bible to cause it to be in Worcester, Massachusetts right now, but that kind of context, which I don't think has always been at the fore of rare book scholarship, um, but piecing together the larger social, demographic, cultural histories. One other thing I'll mention, just because this is, this is one of the most extraordinary mentions, as I was looking for how these copies of Up Biblum God were circulated, um, Samuel Sewell, this prolific diarist in, in Boston, um, who has access to a lot of these Bibles through various channels, he sends one down to a minister in Easton, Massachusetts, Wampanoag homelands, offering it as a kind of sweetener to the minister if the minister will help him get an indigenous young person to be an indentured servant for someone in the Boston area, for a colonizer. Like he's literally using that Bible for human trafficking. And I don't know another way to say that. We don't know the results of that, but these are some of these other stories of the afterlives of the Bible um, that are being used as extremely valuable items of exchange and facilitating all manner of settler colonial um, pressures on native communities. So thank you for that. Christine, okay. I am now sort of able to keep up with the um, raised hand here, but I've got Keith next here. Thank you so much. That was a really wonderful talk and a real pleasure to work through. I wanted to maybe shift a little bit and ask you a bit about beavers and sawmills. Yes. And to maybe ask you to reflect a bit or put it into conversation with your wonderful piece on terra politics mm. and to think about how the sawmill, which I think can be really perceived as bound up in a colonial ecology, changes a bit when in this case it's an indigenous person involved with the sawing and whether yeah. the cosmopolitan people 
that you're working with give us a different way to think about evolving terra politics uh, in the indigenous Atlantic? Uh, thank you so much. And uh, the, the reference that uh, Keith has just made is to a piece I had in New England Quarterly called Terra Politics in the Dawnland, which is a way of thinking through other kinds of human, other than human relationships. Um, I will mention that that piece began as a critique of biopolitics and the framing of, of sort of human-centered accounts of reproduction and survival that got rejected from a different journal, but then found life in New England Quarterly. And I'm really glad that, <laughs> that it is now out there. Um, thinking about lateral kinds of relationships, so not hierarchical, but humans and beavers and trees and water in relationships of reciprocity. And here I'm thinking of, of magnificent work on traditional ecological knowledge by people like Robin Wall Kimmerer, who is actively getting into what a, reci a reciprocity can entail. I think that's, and, and you're pointing to this, right? I think that's part of what makes the Joseph Jeffrey story really challenging, that in a certain way, right, he is, he's cutting down the trees and processing them and doing something that seems to be at odds with certain expectations about indigenous um, beliefs, worldviews, ethics, relationships, right? He's, he's commodifying the trees. And what to do with that? I'm still kind of thinking through um, to recognize that he is very much engaged with modernity, with changes that are happening all around him, and with the extreme pressures of land loss that Narragansett and also Niantic people are experiencing as colonial governments attempt to confine them to increasingly smaller and smaller reservations. How to get by when one's previously extensive web of relationships and of sustenance is being dramatically curtailed, including in the case of many of these reservations, cutting native people off from the coast or from really vital um, waterways. Uh, the other thing I'll say about the sawmill, there's some great work um, Lisa Brooks has done uh, with Cassandra Brooks and uh, a recent dissertation whose name I'm forgetting right now, which is looking at how native people in Wabanaki homelands actively targeted the sawmills, the English sawmills. So like burn down the sawmills um, to push English presence off the land there, right? And the Joseph Jeffrey story is really different. He's not burning down his sawmill, he's thriving with it um, and participating in a market economy that's really different than what we would have seen um, even a century before. So thank you for that. I, I need to work through that more and I love the question. Okay, Ashley, Ashley Cataldo. Speaking Oops. of gratitude for librarians and archivists. <laughs> So I'll just read, uh, I have a, a question in the chat, so I'll just read it. Um, Christine, this is a question about the sort of privileged position of the rare book. Um, and I, I don't know if you are aware, but at AAS, we also have a receipt um, from Occam. He bought a book in 1766 when he was in England from George Keith. It was a Quran. And I believe that there are four, at least in previous correspondence with the library and at Dartmouth, there are four um, copies of Occam's or volumes of Occam's Library at Dartmouth now. So that brings total extant copies of volumes to five. Um, but what can the community do? I mean, you're very focused on community scholarship. What can the community do to sort of reconstruct this library? And is it even important to reconstruct the library when doing so sort of plays into this privileged, you know, rare, rare book world? Yeah, oh, that's a, that's a wonderful question and wonderful to see you, Ashley, as well. Um, I need to get over to AAS or at least virtually um, to look at what you just mentioned. Um, this is, I mean, it's a really foundational question about the structuring of some of the questions that researchers come up with, right? From my interest, there are various reasons to want to know what happened to some of Occam's most valued possessions, in this case, books, but also furniture and other material items, and to be able to account for that uh, dis dispersal or, and or dispossession of them. I also say that knowing that that may not align at every moment or even at all with some of community's own interests. And something that I wanted to, to draw out here that Melissa Tanaquidgenzobel has stressed from a Mohegan vantage is that Occam is important. He's undoubtedly important to that community's history, but less written about, right? There are less volumes on the library shelves today of scholarship about Occam's family who stayed in Mohegan homelands, who did not migrate out. Lucy Tanaquidgen, right, the whole network of relations, including women. And they were not necessarily the ones writing or publishing to this kind of acclaim, and therefore not having that type of visibility in library collections today. And so I'm very mindful of that and, and still kind of struggling with, with what to do with the ways that the archives shapes 
the questions that we can even ask um, while also acknowledging that there are these very different realms of experience and of value in terms of what matters to a community. Um, perhaps related to that, right, there's also, there's a distinct way that Occam is remembered at Mohegan, where he came from, and among the brother town nation, the community that migrated, right? And so some of those differences I am just beginning to learn about. The final thing I'll say about this is that uh, the status of items such as the Bible being discussed here in terms of repatriation, I think is just beginning to be talked about. So this is, you know, I'll make this like two minutes. Um, NAGPRA, the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act of 1990, establishes a federal framework for tribes to be able to repatriate or return home ancestors, uh, sacred items, items of cultural patrimony. And in my understanding, having talked with some, some library folks about this, NAGPRA has not yet really been brought to bear on library and archive collections. The conversation may be moving in that direction, but in a certain way of thinking, how is this Bible not an object of sacred significance? How is this not an object of cultural patrimony? Does the fact that Occam, as inscribed in one of the early pages that he sold it and that it was purchased, does that change its status? It may have an impact within the narrow confines of NAGPRA, um, but within the spirit of the law, I think there's an incredibly important conversation and maybe set of actions to be had around textual items. Um, the, the final other thing I'll say about that, um, and I'll mention Rose Myron's work on the Stockbridge Muncie's repatriation of a Bible from Western Massachusetts uh, or to Western Massachusetts, um, is that NAGPRA has in its description about religion, and I, I would like to cite Ray Gould here from Nipmuc who brought this to my attention. It has a passage about traditional religious items. And I do not think that that has yet been fully explored where that leaves items connected to Christianity that were also deeply traditional, right? And that they have been indigenized and brought within communities. Um, and so I mentioned that because I don't know where this is gonna go. Actually, I don't know if these types of conversations might change the status of items that are presently held in rare books libraries. This is a great conversation. Yeah. Um, Olga. The log. Uh, this is more of a suggestion than a question, as you might want to check American book prices current, um, especially for the earlier years, because what was happening in the 19th century, there was some kind of a form of cultural appropriations, collecting of um, indigenous celebrities, uh, especially intellectuals, because it was kind of a curiosity collecting. Um, and American book prices current is actually very helpful in this regard because they are the only thing that if you use it, it's some, uh, I found that the um, database American book prices current is not necessarily um, as comprehensive as the um, printed volume uh, because they only include main entry not, for example, a, an inscription or a marginalia. So anything from the 1890s to probably 1920s probably worth checking. Thank you again. Thank you so much for that. And I, I will mention here a lot of background conversations with rare books scholars. Um, Mike Kelly, particularly, who I, I talked to zero off and, and heard him talk about how the book market at a certain moment in time began to parcel up, to cut up, you know, remove pages from these Bibles and other texts and sell them as individual items because that increased the market um, uh, potential for them. And so, well, I didn't get into it here, the, the Occam Bible at the Clements has actually been kind of patched together. And so there's a piece of it that is elsewhere that has everything to do with these rare book markets. Um, and I appreciate the, the pointer very much. I'm gonna warn folks that we're gonna run out of time for all these wonderful questions, but we'll, let's keep going and see where, how far we can get. Uh, Blake. Hi, thank you so much, Liz. I think I, I was muted accidentally there for a moment. Um, one thing I was really struck um, by listening to here was the way in which you are sort of talking about the ways in which you're using um, current uh, sort of social relationships um, in your own research and then kind of building those back to look at um, people in the 18th century. And I was especially struck with that when you were talking about kind of coming across the letter from Occam to Shaw um, and how even with a session stuff, it can be, I think, hard to 
think even when you are looking at those of the larger sort of social world in which people are living. Um, so I guess I was interested in hearing you talk a little bit more about how that's that is working in your own work. Um, and also, I guess, how you see maybe these objects like um, the books from Occam's library within the context of sort of living spaces and landscapes, as you were talking um, about at the beginning a little bit more um, specifically in how those maybe the combination of all of those things could let us think about people um, who are maybe less visible um, in the archive as well. Yeah, I, it's a wonderful question and it has me thinking about how the present moment and the formations particularly of, of tribal nation boundaries, some of which have to do with real complexities of the federal recognition process that have um, that have sort of spotlighted certain facets of communities and downplayed others, that that can at times become a real challenge for working to understand social formation several centuries ago, right? That today does not map in an, an absolute direct way, even though there are these profound bonds and connections across time and space. Another way that, that I think this emerges as a, something to think carefully about is all of the native people who belonged to multiple communities, who had family lines that connected them to Mohegan, Niantic, Narragansett, Wampanoag, right? And what that means uh, for them in both historical records, but then through processes of conversation and consultation today. Um, and there's a danger, I think, that some of those folks whose experiences were not anomalous, right? That was very, very much the story of the 18th century, including uh, families developing with people, um, African American people, um, people of color, right? There's this incredible um, um, set of transformations that are happening. How do those folks become more or less visible in the archives? And from a really nitty gritty point of view, when a library catalog, for example, is working on its metadata and trying to decolonize the terminology that is associated with a record, how to work through some of those complexities, right? Um, is Samson Occam identified as Mohegan? Is he identified as brother town? Is there a family way of identifying? Um, and those, I think that's like the, the very edge that some of these digitization projects have been working on, including ways of mapping that acknowledge the movement um, between communities, across communities, and across time and space in these quite fluid, um, these quite fluid respects. Um, the other piece of your question, um, systems of writing, I was thinking about the really fabulous scholarship about the land as writing, thinking of Lisa Brooks's work on Awikigan, multiple forms of signifying and remembering. It could be a birch bark scroll, it could be a petroglyph, it could be the land itself. And to always be keeping that larger set of materials and forms of expression in mind so that we don't get sort of overly sidetracked into the fact that there's a printed book when in fact the role of that book relationally within the rest of a community's home place um, and their homelands may be quite small, right? Just the fact that the book is in a library, I think tends to, to sometimes give these items a certain prominence when places on the land, which may be very quietly kept within communities, you know, deliberately not visualized and mapped so that vandals and looters don't go after them, um, that larger landscape is, is extraordinarily important and that carries right through today. So um, thank you for that. Patrick. Hi there. Hi. Um, first of all, I just want to echo everything that's already been said, uh, just how exciting it is to hear about your research and the way you've uh, kind of integrated this uh, like new methodology with um, uh, kind of the, the, the political dynamics and also this, this really rich history. So thank you for that. And um, I just had two questions, one about terminology and one about language. The first one is, uh, since you mentioned the different terms that are used to describe Indigenous peoples, I was just curious um, about how the, uh, the, the quantity or the number of times, if at all, you've encountered the, the phrase heathen or heathenism uh, in the course of your research, because etymologically, uh, that, that as, as I understand it, derives from the uncultivated land known as the heath, uh, which is to be cultivated through propagation and, um, and agriculture and things like that. And I just wondered if that factored into the, the, the dynamics around nature that you've been talking about. Uh, and secondly, I just wondered about uh, when it comes to the translated Bibles, especially the Eliot Bible, um, am I right in thinking that that's um, a phonetical rendering in English 
of indigenous language that is originally oral? Uh, and if so, how, how easy is it to gauge the kind of access that indigenous communities would have had to this, uh, so, you know, this translated text? Yeah, so um, um, I'll answer these briefly in, in some form. Um, on the, the count of heathen, I don't, I don't have off the top of my head a, a sense of um, uh, how present that is in some of the sources I've looked at, but I do think relevant um, is thinking about indigenous language words for things like building a house. And Stephanie Fielding, who has done language work for the Mohegan tribe, has talked uh, in a publication about the, the language around house building as being like planting, planting a home. And so I've been sitting with that a lot, what it means to understand one's own dwelling, not as a inert thing that is fixed on top of the land, but is instead planted within and generative within it in a, a sort of home space. Um, I also would acknowledge uh, Jenny Davis, who's a Chickasaw linguist who helped talk with me about different, different um, Chickasaw words for, uh, for home spaces, right? And thinking about this from other native contexts. Uh, in terms of the translation on the Bible, I, I generally would hesitate to say much about that because I'm not, I'm not a linguist and I'm not in the Wampanoag language re um, revitalization program. Um, but I will mention that there's, there's a lot of conversation happening about who's, whose language that is, right? Is it a dialect? Is it multiple dialects? What happens when John Eliot, the missionary who's ostensibly in charge of this, is in relationship, often very fraught relationship with a number of different native people who themselves have come from different communities of origin, moved around. Um, and something that I came across in tracking the afterlives of these Bibles was that native communities in it's either the late 17th or early 18th century, early 18th century, were expressing pronounced dissatisfaction with the older Bible that it had words that they didn't know, they had never really understood some of those words, um, and that it was not the most accurate reflection of their language. And so, right, that's this really important insight that language is always changing, and that there's a way that the book that Occam had was an older version of the language, because it's from the late 17th century and he's in the mid 18th century, right? And so how much of that was he reading? How much of that was he sort of puzzling his way through? Um, and I also love that mention that, you know, communities are advocating for better translations because they know that, uh, that English Christian communities are able to more fully read these Bibles. And so they're sensing a, um, a disparity there in terms of the type of text that they have access to. Okay, so we're going to let the last question go to Dee Andrews, and then I'm going to ask all of you to wait all the way through um, the question and Professor DeLucia's answer. And after that, I will ask all of you to unmute and help me to thank Professor DeLucia for a really wonderful, wonderful evening. But first, Dee Andrews. Yes, absolutely wonderful talk, Christina. It was just riveting uh, and so many, on so many different levels, not least of all methodologically. And I, uh, you've already sort of answered the question, first thing I was going to observe, which is the, the illustrated Bible of the Clements, uh, whether or not, in fact, the people who were the, uh, uh, the indigenous people who were working on it actually even thought of it as a Bible, but more as a canvas, uh, something, you know, that it's a piece of paper and you have ink and you got a piece of paper. And you, know, you run into that in book collections everywhere, people using books to keep accounts, to write little memoirs, to describe poetry. So I think this is sort of like that. The other thing I just wanted to observe was, I'm wondering if you know if part of uh, Samson Occam's financial problems had to do with book buying, because that 30 shillings for the book that he inscribed sounds like a a lot of money to me. Um, and I wonder if he was kind of like a lot of book people, um, uh, I'll plead guilty, uh, you know, uh, very so engaged in book collecting that it actually got him into financial trouble. That, I know you can't answer that now, but I was just, it really struck me that that was quite a lot of money. And, and now he has to sell books in order to meet his debts. And so he is using books as a medium of exchange himself. Yeah. Um, in a very interesting way, maybe a little detrimental to his finances. <laughs> yeah, well, so, I mean, it, maybe as a, a super quick concluding thought here, one of the most powerful passages in Samson Occam's own autobiography is where he's been very disillusioned by his mentor, Eliezer Wheelock, who sent him, and he went on this fundraising tour in Britain 
to raise funds for indigenous education and then wheel off turns around and starts what becomes Dartmouth and it's it is more exclusive of indigenous people than Occam had been been led to believe. Um, but one of the most important points he makes in his autobiography is that he has never paid a commensurate salary as white ministers. And he gives this really scathing economic critique of how racism in New England prevents him from being remunerated in a way that is on par with, with English colonial ministers. And so, you know, to your point, I think he's, he struggles at many different moments because of this colonialism to supply himself in the ways he needs to, both himself and his family, having the tools he needs to minister and teach and being confronted with a, a New England print culture marketplace that is very expensive in relationship to his own, um, not, not what it should be salary. Um, so thank you for that. Thank you all so much. Um, I'd ask you if you would all unmute and join me in a round of applause for Christine for this wonderful, wonderful event. And if you can't unmute and clap, you can use your reaction button down at the bottom of the screen. I'm a big fan of those too. You can do that or you can join me in clapping and thanking Christine for a really wonderful evening. I also want to thank all of you um, for joining us this evening. Remember that this event has been recorded and it will be on the OI events uh, website. And also we'll be giving you, uh, we'll be sending you an email with a request for your response to a survey. So thanks to everyone so much, but of course, primarily, thank you so, so much, Christine. This was really marvelous. I'm doing my reaction button again. <laughs> thank, thank you, Karen and everyone. <laughs> thank you all. Thanks so much. Good night. Good night.